there is an article in Politico. It says Europe's Trumpian nightmare, and it seems that they're thinking that even overnight Donald Trump can change the policy in Ukraine, not sending any more aid and weapons to Ukraine. How do you find? Do you think their concerns are legitimate? I don't think there's anything legitimate about the European Union to begin with. So I don't think their concerns are legitimate because I don't think their opinions are legitimate. Um, they're, they're a pathetic entity that's allowed itself to be um, taken over by American interests, et cetera. And now um, having sold their soul, um, you know, having been America's paid whore for so many years, they're sending with grow moral conscience. <laughs> and, oh, well, we... We want, we want to be independent. You're not independent. There's nothing independent about Europe. Look what they're saying. They want a president who will continue to provide the umbrella of comfort. To keep the leash on and the collar on, to hold it tight, say heal and sit and, and all this. Um, versus a president says, I don't care about you. I'm willing to go feed yourself. They don't want to feed themselves because they can't feed themselves. That's what's really this is about. This is about Europe acknowledging that they suck across the board and they're scared to death because what donald trump is saying is grow up stand up on your own two feet get the hell out of the nest and fly <laughs> they can't they can't fly they can't stand on their own two feet they're pathetic pathetic and that's what this is all about this is the exposure of the pathetic reality of europe um and it's a good thing and i say that as somebody who likes europe i mean i actually and my family origins are European. Um, I've lived in Europe. I've traveled in Europe extensively. I would love nothing more than Europe standing up on its own two feet. So when I go to France, I'm going to France, not an American colony. When I go to Germany, I'm going to Germany, not an American colony. You know, I don't want to visit an American colony. I want to visit a nation full of people who are proud of who they are. It's a foreign country for a reason. It's not supposed to be like America. It's supposed to be their own country. It's what I love about going to Russia. When you go to Russia, you know damn well where you're at. You're in Russia. There is no mistaking it. It's Russia. For better or for worse, it's Russia. But now you go to Europe and you get America light. It's, it's, I mean, this European Union has watered down what it means to be a European. Because being a European is a meaningless term. There's no European. What is a European? They don't exist. There's a German. There's a Frenchman. There's an Italian. There's the Dutch. You know, there's the Austrians. There's the Poles. I know what they are, but a European? What is a European? There is no European. There is no Europe. There's a collection of nations that <coughs> could come up with a loose framework, but to try to come up with a singular foreign policy, especially now that you've expanded it to the East, the, you know, the East's interests are not the West's interests, even within the West. Talk about the central bank debates between Germany and France, and you realize that there's already a division there. England pulled out. They didn't want to be part of Europe, um, you know, Brexit and all this. So, you know, I don't care what Europe thinks. I mean, the, the fact is Europe has to learn to stand on its own. I say that as an American because it's not healthy for America or Europe for this current relationship to continue. It's not healthy. NATO is a poison pill. We need to ditch NATO as soon as possible. And the sooner Europe realizes that, the better off Europe will be. Because then Europe will be compelled to stand on their own two feet and build defensive capabilities that are realistic, not backed up by the artificiality of the perception of American military power. And once Europe understands its limitations and its capabilities, it can then figure out what a sane foreign policy will be with Russia. Understand that the policy that many Europeans have right now of being an adversary to Russia is unsustainable if Europe was called upon to stand on their own two feet because they can't defeat Russia. They can only think about it with America backing them up. And America shouldn't be in that business. We shouldn't be in the business of tipping the scale uh, on that. There's no reason for Europe and Russia to be enemies. There's every reason for Europe and Russia to be partners. 
but they can't be partners so long as America's in the mix. You got to pull America out, let Europe stand up and make its own realizations that collectively they and individually they need to be working with Russia, not against Russia. And that's not a threat to America. It actually helps us because that creates a stronger, that creates stability. Americans need to understand just how well off we'd be if we stopped spending over a trillion dollars a year on defense. You know, we don't need to go around the world and kick hornet's nests and then complain every time we get stung and then spend all our money building, you know, mechanisms to protect ourselves from hornets. Stop kicking a hornet's nest and you don't have to worry about it. You know, there are things we can do. We don't have to have an economic war with China. We can use China's economic capabilities to our benefit, tap into their uh, supply chains, bring our strengths to the table, make sure that we are essential to the Chinese economy as they are to ours. Um, you know, we could, we could again, go into Africa with a whole new approach. Um, and, you know, instead of this neo-colonial approach, go in like the Chinese do. You know what the first thing China does when it goes to a foreign country? It builds a damn road. Why? Because that allows them to get in, meet, and take things out. The road is essential. The connection. What's the first thing we do? We demand that they have LGBTQ rights. See the difference? In your opinion, in is it going to change the mindset of Germans in the government in Germany to be more independent? Because we know how important Russia is for Germany. They, they cannot survive without Russia, with the current situation that they're having. If you're, you know, it's one thing if you're a, you know, a 22-year-old kid who just graduated from, from college with heavy college debt and you don't have a job. Okay, live in a mom's basement might be something you have to do for a year or two to, to get yourself going. But the Europeans are 45 years old and they're still in mommy's basement. It's time for the Europeans to get the hell out of mommy's basement. And Donald Trump will kick them out of mommy's basement. That's that's the you know the the positive. Europeans are afraid of this because it's sort of scary. You're being called to, to go out on your own and, and and make your own decisions. Um, you know you won't have mommy there to help you. But it's what has to happen for Europe to grow up. And Donald Trump is the president that can make it happen because he's not he's not a prisoner of the legacy of NATO. He recognizes NATO as, for the inefficient organization that it is. You know, um, it, it, it's, it's stupid for America to spend this much money on NATO. It's just dumb. We need to get the hell out of there, unplug from that, start reducing our defense expenditures, um, and force Europe to stop living off of American largesse. You know, we got Europeans who talk big now, but they talk big because they're backed by America. But imagine if they actually had to put the money up to back up their words without American support. They suddenly wouldn't be saying those things. You know, I could sit there and articulate all... If, I, if I've got a trust fund and daddy willing to foot the bill, I can talk about Lamborghinis and Bugattis all day long. But when daddy's bill, you know, bank account's not there and the trust fund money's not there and I got to go out and work, suddenly that, uh, that Toyota Camry's looking pretty damn good. And it's time for Europe to stop talking Lamborghini and Bugatti and start talking Toyota Camry, the equivalent. Uh, they need to downsize their, their aspirations based upon the reality of Europe, not you know a Europe backed by... Uh, the United States, Germany has to start looking out for German interests and Germans' interests uh, more closely aligned with Russia than um, than they're currently allowed to uh, to articulate. But you're seeing that that growing recognition. Look, Olaf Scholz isn't the solution to Germany. Olaf Scholz needs to be voted out. His coalition needs to be destroyed. It appears that it is. They're the next generation of German politicians will be the ones that will be called upon to make some of these hard decisions. When New York Times is talking about that Ukraine is losing, do you think that the United States, deep state, those people who are, we can call it deep state or kind of blobs, have decided to change their strategy in Ukraine? Well, that implies that there was a strategy to begin with. I think the only strategy that they've had is a reactive strategy uh, that's premised on uh, an absurd notion of the United States will use this conflict to weaken Russia and achieve the strategic defeat of Russia. Um, you know, a hope and a dream. Um, but there's nothing substantive behind that. We don't back it up with the resources. If that's truly what we wanted. 
uh, we aren't giving them the resources. We should be doubling down on Ukraine, pouring in uh, munitions and, uh, and, 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 you know, when they need it on a timely fashion, more air defense, things of that nature. If that's truly what we wanted, but we've just sort of been feeding it in there because <coughs> we're trying to win on the cheap. We're, we're, we're praying for some sort of economic collapse in Russia that's just not happening. Um, and, you know, the, the, the political diminishment of Vladimir Putin, which just isn't happening. He's getting stronger. Uh, their economy is getting stronger. Uh, BRICS is making their economy more robust, more diversified, more difficult to, uh, to impede through the use of sanctions. So we don't have a strategy. We don't. Uh, we, have a, we have a blind hatred towards Russia that, that guides everything. To have a strategy, we'd actually have to have people that knew Russia intimately, who uh, who who could interface with the Russians, um, and then you you understand Russia's strengths, Russia's weaknesses. You understand areas that could be exploited or areas that should be developed, uh, depending on what priorities you have. We should hope that the priorities are towards peaceful coexistence, um, but you can't peacefully coexist with that which you don't understand, that which you have used you know Russophobic uh, tendencies to promote fear. It's derived from ignorance. You see, the ignorance of Russia is to the benefit of these policymakers. They don't want an informed American public about Russia. That's why they pulled my passport. That's why they don't let me travel to Russia, because I was collecting data, bringing it back, and beginning the process of informing a larger public. They don't want that. They want the public to be ignorant about Russia, and from that ignorance comes fear, and that fear gets exploited by the policymakers, who then say, we need to be stronger, we need to build this, we need to build that. But the reality is you don't need to build any of that. The best way to bring about stable relations with the Russians is actually to reach out the hand of friendship, shake the hand, sit down at the table and talk to them. They're reasonable people and they will listen to reasonable, you know, solutions. Um, you know, they're not like America that says my way or the highway. I mean, increasingly we're putting them in that, in that situation, but the Russians have always said, we're willing to talk and we're willing to sit down. We're willing to listen. And historically they've been willing to make compromises far more than we have. So, you know, I, I don't, it, it's impossible for me to talk about a strategy coming because I look at the resumes, I look at, um, you know, the, the people that are advising, I call them Putin whisperers. Uh, you know, they, they all have <laughs> something in common. They went to one of these big universities where they wrote a PhD thesis on the evils of Vladimir Putin. That's it. That's all they know. Vladimir Putin's bad. They don't know anything about Russia. They're ignorant about Russia. They don't know the truth about Russia. And they don't want to know the truth about Russia information accurate information about russia is their enemy that's why they suppress it just to wrap up this session scott again we're witnessing that in washington they're talking about north korean soldiers in russia when they're talking this way they're pushing this rhetoric two things comes to the mind when one would be they want to just say russia is nothing they need north korean soldiers to help them they're not doing well on the battlefield. On the other hand, you can imagine they want to escalate the conflict in Ukraine. They want to send even NATO troops to Ukraine to fight officially. To fight Nobody wants to send NATO troops. To, let's just stop that nonsense. Nobody wants to send NATO troops to Ukraine. Nobody wants to send. If they wanted to send NATO troops to Ukraine, they'd already be there. Nobody wants because they know what the consequences will be. Instant death. I mean, we. I'm just saying it straight up. We shouldn't even entertain that thought. Find me one, seriously, I'm not talking about rhetoric, one European nation right now, right now that's saying I'm willing to send boots to, to Ukraine. Name one. You can't. Because they don't exist. Nobody's willing to send boots to Ukraine. They'll send them as mercenaries. They'll send them as advisors. And I'm talking about give me a whole damn armored division. Because that's what it's going to take. Put an armored division on the ground in Ukraine today. Go. A, they can't do it. They don't have the resources. And B, politically, they can't do it. There's no support at home. And C, they know they'll get beat. There's no sustainability. So that is not an option. I reject it out right off the bat. It's just not an option. If it was an option, it would have already been implemented. Because Ukraine's reached the tipping point, the po point of no return. They've lost. Even if you sent in NATO divisions right now, they couldn't stop what's happening on the battlefield. So nobody wants to send in troops. We shouldn't even entertain that notion. It's a non-existent thing. It's just now a matter of managing the collapse of Ukraine. Of Ukraine. That's all they have. Russians are 21 kilometers away from the Nepopetrovsk border. That means that they're 21 kilometers away from reclaiming all of Donetsk. 
Once they reclaim all of Donetsk, they'll get all of Zaporizhia. Then they'll turn to the business of recapturing the, the uh, right bank of Kherson. If Russia is allowed to engage in military operations designed to recapture the right bank of Kherson, they're going on to Odessa because the same military might it takes to project power over the river, get there and sustain that presence there is the same that you need to project onto Odessa and beyond. Um, the West doesn't want this to happen. The, what the West needs to do right now is pick the point where you're going to say stop. Ukraine withdraws from all this territory in a controlled fashion. It turns over to Russia and we bring it into this war. But to do that, you have to have the Ukrainian government willing to accept those terms. Right now, the Ukrainian government's not willing to do that. And the West, it's very difficult for the West to impose its will on Ukraine right now. Politically, it's difficult because we've, we're going to stand with you till the end. We keep saying we don't mean that. Um, if we did, we'd have boots on the ground. We don't mean it. What we need is to, and this is the tragedy of it. Again, it's like I say, we, we don't care about the Palestinian people. We don't care about the people of Ukraine. We don't. We don't care about them at all because our policy right now is to let Ukraine suffer more until they reach the realization that they have no choice but to do this. I mean, how cowardly is that approach? How craven is that approach? We, it means we don't care about the Ukrainians. We never have. But that's, that's what's happening here. We're letting the Ukrainians reach the realization that they are, it's indefensible what they're doing. And they are going to be compelled to withdraw beyond the Dnieper River, whatever. And at that point in time, we will come in and say, now it's time to sit down with the Russians. And, and, uh, boom. and one of the first things they'll offer the Russians is you get your, all that territory. Because you know that's that's the only thing, and then they'll you know they'll try to negotiate other things. Russia won't accept it because Russia in the driver's seat. But again, Russia doesn't. I'm just telling you right now, Russia does not want to invade Odessa. The Russian government does not want to do that. They want this war over, but it, the war has to end on their terms. But they also understand that their terms can't include the invasion of Odessa, can't include the occupation of Sumy. That's a whole new phase of the war. Hundreds of thousands of more troops would have to be mobilized. Um, the, the, the economy would, you know, there's huge inflation, 21% inflation going on in Russia right now because their economy is overheated because of the war economy. They need to bring all this stuff under control. And they can't bring it under control if they're expanding the war. So Russia doesn't want to expand the war. Russia wants this war to end, but it has to end on Russian terms. And those Russian terms are they get all their territory. All the territories of the four of the four um, oblasts that Russia absorbed through the um, through the um, uh, referendums in uh, September 2022, then they'll dictate things about the demilitarization, denazification, things like that that Ukraine will have to take. Um, they'll negotiate the lifting of sanctions and, and things of that nature. Um, but what it'll do is it, it'll spare Russia and Ukraine and the world the because. To go on to Odessa, you're talking about extending this war by a couple of years. Russia doesn't have the means to do it right now. Russia would have to mobilize all new forces. Um, you know, they, they, they've built a military capable of achieving the objectives that they want to achieve. But they don't have a military capable of moving on to Odessa right now. You know, when you start talking about occupying territory, you need boots on the ground to do that occupation. As you thrust into Odessa, you have exposed flanks. You increase your flank exposure. One of the problems that the Russians ran into in the fall of 2022 is as they withdrew their forces, they thinned out the lines. They had this massive you know, frontage that they had to man, but they thinned out the lines. They didn't have enough manpower to man the lines. And so the Ukrainians were able to launch attacks that penetrated and compelled the Russians to withdraw, recruit new troops, mobilize troops to thicken the lines and all that stuff. Russia right now has a density right now that's impenetrable by the Ukrainians. But it, just look at the map. You move to Odessa, you're extending those lines. <laughs> you're and Unless you have the troops capable of manning those lines with the density necessary, um, you're inviting disaster, especially if you're making a lunge up there where the Ukrainians can do, you know, you know, pinch you off someplace. Russia doesn't want to fight that fight. That's my firm belief. The Russian government doesn't want to fight that fight. Putin doesn't want to fight that fight. Um, the Ministry of Defense doesn't want to fight that fight. And so I think that 
you know, we're, we're, we're looking for the tipping point to be reached. That tipping point could be reached this winter, maybe early in spring, where Ukraine says, we, we can't do this anymore. And the West says, we, we got nothing left to give you. And, um, and, uh, and, and they go to the negotiating table. You mentioned Odessa, and everybody knows how Odessa is important for Russia and for Ukrainians. But do you think at the end of the day, in any sort of negotiations between the West and Russia, what are the main concerns of Russia considering this city? What are the main considerations? Are they going to give it to Ukraine, just to whatever well, they all, want? It's not giving it to Ukraine. Ukraine has it. Yeah, no, I'm talking so about Russia, Russia, give it, Russia would have to take it. Yeah, it's not Russia is to give away. It doesn't belong to Russia. It belongs to Ukraine. And that's, you know, that's a reality that people I know that all the pro Russian out there. It's a Russian city and all. It's a Ukrainian city. It may have a Russian heritage, it may be all this. I'm not denying that. But let's just be frank right now. It's a Ukrainian city that's become even more Ukrainian since this war has happened because many of the pro Russian elements have been driven out, have fled or, you know, or have turned. Um, people that might have been sympathetic to Russia maybe aren't because of the bombardment, et cetera. But, you know, you, Odessa is a Ukrainian city. Um, it belongs to Ukraine. It's not Russia's to give. Russia doesn't get to dictate that outcome. If Russia wants to dictate the outcome of Ukraine, they have to capture it. They have to take it. And I'm telling you right now, Russia doesn't want to do that. That's just too damn expensive. Too expensive. Their concerns are, uh, this is why Russia has talked about, you know, 50,000 strong Ukrainian armed forces, which is really little more than a border guard and a, and a police force. Um, and I think there will be demilitarized zones. I think Odessa will be a demilitarized zone. The biggest Russian concern is that Odessa is used as a springboard to launch attacks against Crimea and southern Russia. That can never be allowed to happen. So I think you're going to be talking about a demilitarized zone with, um, you know, some sort of uh, observer presence uh, there. Um, uh, I think you're going to see that all along the contact with the Russian border, um, demilitarized zones. Um, and then whatever's left of the Ukrainian military will be this rump force that'll, you know, be in Western Ukraine and you know, around Kiev. But, um, you know, that's that. But <laughs> Odessa isn't Russia's to give away. They don't own it. Ukraine does. And Russia will have to pay a very heavy price to take it. Too heavy. Too heavy. Uh, and it changes everything. BRICS, people need to understand, Russia went into BRICS, and one of the things that, that it's promoting there is de-escalation of global crises. Russia can't afford to escalate. Russia has to bring this Ukrainian conflict to an end on reasonable terms. And right now they're in a position to dictate reasonable terms. But the world isn't going to sit there and, and applaud Russia if they say, no, we insist on Odessa, Kharkov, Sumy, Nipa, Petrovsk. That all has to become part of Russia. That's a massive escalation. The world isn't going to support that. You know, right now, Russia has the world on its side. Russia is not going to commit, you know, strategic suicide, geopolitical suicide by, you know, insisting on things that, that represent an escalation or are considered unreasonable demands. And it is an unreasonable demand because it's a Ukrainian city right now. Russia has no inherent right to say, oh, you have to give it to us. I don't think Ukraine would ever do that. And I think the West would help Ukraine resist that. Um, and should, to be honest. That's that's something that should be done. I, I condemn Ukraine for what they've done in the Donbass. I think they made a fatal mistake. I think there was a necessity to link Crimea uh, with a land bridge. Uh, but, you know, Russia was willing to give up Zaporizhia and Kherson. That was part of the April 2022 agreement. Russia wasn't demanding those territories. But now we deal with the reality with those are Russian territories. And I support Russia 100% on that. But if Russia said, no, we, you, you have to give us Odessa, no, they don't. No, they don't. And if Russia wants to turn itself into a nation that actually starts to walk, the, walk and talk the talk of being the aggressive state that Europe is afraid of, demanding uh, that, that Odessa be turned over puts Russia in that category. I don't, see, I don't see Vladimir Putin being that leader. He hasn't said anything that puts him in that category. He is a rational person. He believes in the rule of international law. And so I, I don't see, you know, I, don't, I just don't see that playing out. No. Not at this stage. I mean, if, if, if BRICS wasn't in the equation and Russia didn't have that kind of pressure placed on, you know, its geopolitical future uh, for de-escalation, 
you know, maybe uh, Russia would succumb to some sort of, you know, nationalist, uh, you know, security oriented approach. But I don't see Russia, I don't see the Russian leadership saying Odessa has to belong to us because that's an escalation, one that the Europe, the world won't support. And all it does is lengthen this conflict. And Russia does not want this conflict to go on. They're winning right now. And they have positioned themselves to be able to continue this conflict. But this can't go on forever. It's not good for the Russian economy. Uh, it's not good for the world. And, um, you know, so I, I, I'm a firm believer that we're going to see some sort of negotiated peace that that is to the benefit of Russia, but it'll be reasonable. It's not going to be unreasonable.